This is a production of Cornell University. After the initial excitement wears off when people come by to see the Titan Aram, uh, I'm often asked, why do we do this? Why do we study strange plants and unusual plants like this? Um, in the grand scheme of things, uh, does it cure disease? Does it help us increase crop yield? Does it, what, is it, what is it good for? Um, in my mind, uh, studying plants like the Titan Aram are, are it's simply representative of discovery-based science. Um, we don't know before we do studies what we're going to learn. That's the essence of exploration. And um, the Titan Aram and plants like it are another kind of landscape to explore in the natural world, part of the, the, the wonders of biological diversity uh, across the planet. So, but I like to give tangible examples to people of what's interesting and useful about discovery-based science. Um, we can start with the plant itself. Its, its biology is unusual enough to cause us to wonder, you know, why would you create, uh, why, would, why would a plant marshal that much energy and devote that much of its reproductive effort to being so large and so stinky and so hot um, for such a short amount of time and then go several years between reproductive uh, events instead of doing it every year like migrating birds. Um, and when we take a, a closer look at what the plant is doing, it's attracting flies and beetles that are decomposers. You know, they, their ecological niche is to, is to use rotting materials as, um, as their food for their, for their young, for their, for their larvae and grubs, et cetera. Um, so one hidden benefit from studying a plant like the Titan Arum is it has been finely tuned by natural selection to be attractive to what some humans regard as pest insects. Okay, so blowflies or screw worms are the kinds of flies that lay um, eggs or, or, or larvae into rotting meat, or in some cases, in the case of screw worms, um, into wounds of animals that are still alive. And so these animals are pests to agriculture because they um, cause a lot of damage to, uh, to livestock. And so if you look back in the really applied scientific literature, you'll find Lucy lure and S worm lure. These are code names or, or, or trademarks for, um, for volatile lures that people use to trap these flies and keep them away from their livestock or keep them off of their farms. And so a lot of research went into that. People had to test different combinations of these noxious odors uh, and, and the right ratios and the right sort of barcode to attract these flies. Well, guess what? The plants have figured that out already. You know, so one immediate benefit from studying plants like this, which are so, so effective at trapping flies, is that they were the code breakers. They figured it out. We could simply copy them. It's a, a form of engineering is biomimicry, right? The idea of um, where does Velcro come from or the, the feet of geckos that allow them to walk on slippery surfaces. Uh, there are large industries based on using art of artificial materials to mimic what are very effective ruses and, and devices in nature. Um, so here's another one. These plants have picked the, the code of female flies and beetles. And we can use the same volatile compounds and the same ratios that they make as lures. It's already been done. Okay, so that's one example very close to what the plant does. Um, but there's another layer of this, another level of discovery that's really important. And that is the connections, the hidden connections that we don't see coming. Um, a, an example I like to use with my students is to talk about modern genomic science. Okay, so this is a huge, huge part of, uh, of, the, of the wedding between technology and science and medicine and health is the idea that we now have the technology to explore genomes, not only the human genome, but, but the genomes of other creatures, the, the pathogens that live in us, the, the creatures that are helpful to us, the animals and plants that we've domesticated, etc. But that whole field, the whole edifice of the science of genomics is built upon serendipitous discoveries. Okay, so going back to Balbiani, uh, who was an embryologist in France in the, in the 19th century, Balbiani studied um, something that people would think was frivolous. You know, the salivary chromosomes of midges, kind of little fly, mosquito-like fly. And Balbiani was just curious, and what Balbiani discovered was that 
they have um, these polyteen chromosomes that puff up. And this was the first way to visualize genes as beads on a string before better microscopy and better genetic technologies uh, were developed in the early part of the 20th century. So the, the foundation of genetics as a field um, rests on this kind of frivolous discovery by Balbiani about what salivary gland chromosomes are and they're in fruit flies as well as midges and there were our first beads on a string in genetic um, dogma. But it's more than that. Um, the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, this is a way of amplifying, rapidly amplifying specific DNA sequences. This was, the invention came out in the late 80s when I was a beginning student. And I remember the, you know, how fundamentally it changed the field of genetics. But you can't do PCR without um, TAC polymerase. This is, this is a, a, an enzyme, DNA polymerase enzyme, that's taken from uh, an extremophile, a bacterium named um, Thermus aquaticus that lives in hot springs, you know, in places like Yellowstone. And so who would study that? It's frivolous to go on a boondoggle with government money to a national park and scoop out bacteria from hot springs. Except it isn't frivolous because Thermus aquaticus has to do DNA replication in 70 or 80 degrees centigrade water. Okay, it's ridiculous. E. coli doesn't do that. Common bacteria can't do that. They melt. So, um, Carrie Mullis and the inventors of, of, of polymerase chain reaction realized um, through a long series of papers that were, that were published over a decade and a half um, that TAC polymerase was the tool they needed to solve the problem of rapid cycling of uh, DNA um, um, amplification. And it doesn't stop there. Um, Nowadays, to visualize, you know, transformative genetics, you need reporter genes, and people have used all kinds of different reporter genes. Um, but the one that's really made a difference is green fluorescent protein, GFP. It was a Nobel Prize given uh, for this discovery a few years ago. But it comes from a jellyfish. And why would you ask the NIH to support studies of jellyfish that light up in the water column at night in the oceans? That's frivolous, isn't it? But it's not. GFP is so incredibly important and useful. And science is full of those kind of discoveries. Um, these stinky plants that we're studying, we don't know ahead of time whether it's going to give us a really valuable tool. But the way that it coordinates turning on temperature and scent and opening and closing and, re and its respiration, which is really, really high for a plant, um, it's got molecular switches. It's got nano switches in it. We need to learn from that. It could be so useful uh, to apply what we learn from these very, very specialized plants to other, other plants that are important to us um, in, our, in, our, in our daily lives. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.